human excrement in the mailbox. It used to be a dreadful problem, of course, years ago, intended for the previous owner, but uh, unfortunately he never left a forwarding address. Welcome to episode 29 of the Jonathan Creek podcast, where we've recently received a, a few interesting things in the mail. Yeah. Electronically, <laughs> fortunately enough. And they weren't even intended for a, a former owner, they were definitely for us. We have informed the police once again, and you kept a pair of them. How are you? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you today? Tired. Why? What's wrong? Ah, just generally tired. Recovering from the weekend still. And unfortunately, <laughs> we've got an hour and a half episode here to discuss. You say unfortunately, people are looking forward to this. Fortunately, we've got an hour and a half episode. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. So with that in mind, I think we should dispense with the chitter chatter. Only the, only the hardy are going to be with us for the full length anyway, so. Do you have a summary? I do. Crack on. <laughs> In the Judas Tree, Jonathan and Joey take on another house with a mysterious past as is their wont. On this occasion, it is the memory of a murderer which threatens to drive a young woman to the edge of her sanity. When history appears to repeat itself and death visits the home once again, our intrepid duo are convinced that an injustice has been visited on their friend. With the evidence stacked against her, however, can they find an explanation strong enough for a jury to believe? Or will the scales of justice tilt against them? Justice indeed. We will no doubt talk about that towards the end of this podcast. But we begin this week in the countryside where we've got some nice sound design, I thought, showing a, a, a blusterous day, which is interrupted by two lost women, girls, in a car listening to Blondie. Yeah, the... Driver appears to be drinking beer from a can and as she discards it at the roadside we learn that the year is 1988. Possibly. The can's expiry date is 88 so it could be... Some Anywhere from 86 to 89. <laughs> yeah. I've got an issue with a lot of things in this episode and the first that stands out is the the ages or the age of the, the main character this week, the main guest star. Okay. If this is the 80s we come to learn that she's only in her early 30s, I would suggest. Well, it's what, we're 22 years later, see? Yeah. So she's 8 here, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doesn't work. And also Blondie. Of course, they've been around for a long time, they've, they've kept putting music out, but if you're trying to uh, position a, a time frame, Blondie was more of a, a 70s band than an 80s band. Yeah. Also, the car looked to me too new to be 80s. Okay. From the number plate. I could be wrong about that, but the number plate looked to me like it was early 90s. Hmm. I could, someone will maybe fact check that for us. <laughs> anyway, as they pull over to look at a map, one of them notices a house that she decides to go and ask directions from. Yeah, the other one doesn't know what she's talking about. There's no house. So, Emily, who is the blonde, yeah, who has lost the house, she gets out to go and check what is now an empty field and we see her touch uh, an E, a letter E in her necklace. Yes. And as she wanders through this field, she's grabbed around the ankle at the second attempt by a man writhing in the weeds. He's like a cross between Jigsaw from the Saw movies and what's your one from The Hobbit? Um, Gollum. Gollum, yeah. Yeah, I thought he looked more like a not quite dead version of the dead body we saw floating to the top of the stairs. Ah, yes. <laughs> and the three gamblers. Yes. Yes. Anyhow, she beats him with her shoe and runs off. Yes, she is quite violent. Very. Mm. We think of the, the credits after this cold open and we come back to the sight of a green cat. We do. We see a... Uh, a pussy in uh, night vision and the exterior to a large gated house named Green Lanterns and inside we see lots of, I think it's Egyptian artefacts. Or... Yeah, we get the patented POV shot as we move around this, this house and we flip through a wall and see a woman having a nightmare obviously. Yep, she's in her bedroom where she sits up and we see from her necklace that it is apparently the girl from the 80s. Or someone whose name starts with the same letter. She gets up and from her window she sees a man sitting 
outside downstairs working at a table and this seems to calm her for a moment until he is joined by a woman. Yeah, presumably his wife, I don't know. She bore, I thought, a slight resemblance to the woman who'd been driving the car, but it's not her. Although that might have a part to play. Yeah. Just on that, I thought the actress who played Emily here bore a resemblance to Jodie Whittaker, is it the new Doctor Who? Mm-hmm, a little bit, yeah. Uh-huh. I wouldn't argue with that one. Did I say the new Doctor Who? Yeah. The new Doctor, is that, am I wrong? Either way. Really? Yeah. Yeah, but he's not, you've said before, you, you don't call them the Doctor Who. They're not the Doctor Who, you certainly don't call them the Doctor Who. <laughs> you, you don't call them Doctor Who? Well, that was kind of something that came up in the last episode or two. Okay, I'll just call her the Doctor Who. The Doctor Who, yeah. okay. Yeah, back to the, the wife of this man. She looks up, there's a bit of aggression there, you can tell her some sort of animosity. Some kind of tension anyway, mm-hmm. and... Emily then backs away from the window and we skip ahead to the next morning. We do indeed, where she is being instructed in her new duties by the housekeeper, Mrs Gantry, an older staff member, including what to do with the special delivery that we heard at the top of the podcast. Okay, viewers on Netflix won't have seen that little mini scene. There's another couple of bits I've got noted later on. Up in Hugo's bedroom, Hugo is the man, the, the man of the house. Yes. He is the man she saw sitting outside the night before and he is in the room getting ready while she takes the laundry to to put it all away. But she drops some of his shirts just as the the half-naked Hugo appears from the bathroom and there's a little little, little bit of flirting here, a little spark. Yeah, he's quite kind to her and helps her pick it up so that she doesn't get into trouble for uh, creasing the the shirts. Yeah, there was more cleavage focus again from uh, David Rennick, I thought, in his directing. I think I've kind of started blanking it out now. Mm-hmm. So you can't look at a scene of Jonathan Creek without seeing mm. either one or two mm. things that are going to upset you. They're not going to upset They're you. Not going to upset They're not going to upset you at all. No. At all. Most I, I, people, I should just be care. clear about this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the cleavages that have been shown and, and focused on in Jonathan Creek have been more than happy to, uh, generally, I think. I'll... It's just worth noting the trend. Same as the point of view shots. It's a trope of the show. Yeah. You wouldn't do it these days. No, I mean, I don't even think it was necessary. It's kind of a cheap way to yeah. titillate the audience, isn't it? Ah, things are cheap and cheerful. They aren't too bad. Anyway, let's move on. We skip ahead a little bit later and Emily's still putting laundry away whilst talking to Hugo. Yes, and we see Harriet, the wife, walk past disdainfully as they two continue their, their conversation. Obviously, uh, maybe there's some jealousy being hinted at here. Maybe. Emily's asking Hugo about his novels and how he puts himself in the head of a murderer. Yeah, I mean, have we mentioned that? He's a murder mystery writer. We haven't because it hadn't come up until right now. Did you not mention it in your summary? No. Okay, well that's what he is. He is. A writer. A writer of murder mystery. That's why you call him a murder mystery writer. Well, maybe a crime writer you could call it that. Okay. He says the trick is to get the reader trusting the wrong people. And I thought, and I've written down here, clue for episode, question mark. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Down in the kitchen, Harriet asks the very fastidious Mrs Gantry to get uh, some more appropriate work clothes for Emily. Yeah, it also appears that somebody has polished the fruit. Yeah, Mrs Gantry. She has. (laughs) In the bedroom, uh, Mrs Gantry is giving this advice to Emily. Yes, before informing her of what has occurred in the past in the house. Well, you see, the folly of unrequited lust has more than once brought tragedy upon this house. According to the story, in the late 1880s, a young Egyptian woman of striking beauty came to work here as a housekeeper. Her name was Selima El Sharad, and scarcely had she joined the household of Dr. Thaddeus Northcott than she found herself attending to his needs by night as well as day. Until finally, when his passion for her cooled, a strange demonic force is said to have transformed her from seductress to sorceress. And she put a curse on her former lover, predicting the exact date and time of day that he would meet a dreadful, agonizing death. Well, as a man of science, he had little time for any suggestion of witchcraft and simply went about his business in the normal way. Until the appointed hour came round. 
I liked how from the clip there, he supposedly cooled on her in the middle of. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> in the moment. Yeah. No, no more, I no longer like you. So, in the flashback, we saw the victim sitting alone in the middle of the garden, and we find out what was heard and what occurred. Can you tell us? Yes, um, Mr Thaddeus there looking at his pocket watch to see that it was 3.15, starts to smile, he survived this threat. At which point, Salima, Salima, Selina, Salima, hidden in the undergrowth, screams and then he dies. Very high pitched scream. Was it? Mm -hmm. That may prove vital. Could do. Gantry goes on to explain that no cause of death was found, and as a result, Salima went unpunished. And to add to Emily's unease, she apparently is now sleeping in Salima's bedroom. Yeah, and they've rather bizarrely left her photo up on the wall. <laughs> Why? So here's the housekeeper who worked here 130 years ago. And was suspected of killing the, the owner? Yes. What? We've immortalised her in <laughs> print. Anyway, apparently this could still be um, Selena's room, if you believe in the power of a restless spirit to take... Restless soul? The spirit to take control of a soul. Yeah, I don't... No, it's, it's nonsense. We're at the rehearsal hall now, where Jonathan is practising a trick with Adam's head. Yeah, Adam... Meanwhile, is ruining his recent visit to Africa. Yeah, it's been a, a bad PR experience. What's happened? Well, he's taken this trip for magic relief. And <laughs> when he got to Africa, they've asked him how he is. And he said he was hungry. And that's come over quite poorly. Well, I think it might have been worse than that. He was greeted by nuns and he says, Jesus, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the paper has called him an outrageous xenophobe. Well, yeah, not just for that... I think that the article that you're referring to goes on to suggest that there was a reference to cannibalism. He denies that. I think in this case he's probably right. But it didn't come across well. No. And as Jonathan goes to get something to remove a, a prop from Adam's neck, in walks a very happy Joey, who is immediately insulted and condescended upon by Jonathan being... An arse. Which, it's, it's his usual thing. He did yeah. this exact thing to Carla and he's done similar things to Maddie in the past. He's just very rude to her. Mm -hmm. He observes from his powers of deduction that she's been waitressing and she's looking for work mm -hmm. other than that. And instead of sympathising and being a good friend, he mocks and abuses her for it. Yeah, it's not nice. No. But she takes it a bit better than Carla and Maddie ever did. She's talking about needing a job. But during this conversation, they are inter uh, they're interrupted by Adam, who tells them that a showgirl has resigned. She would rather leave than, than work for a bigot. A massive racist, yes. <laughs> yeah. He's concerned because now he has nobody to do his Indian basket trick. No, but this is obviously fortunate for the game Joey, who is next seen in the basket dodging swords, much to the delight of Adam. I think she's a bit of a natural. Yes, absolutely. And if you're watching on Netflix, that's the end of this scene. Really? Yes. Okay, when it's not on Netflix, what happens? Joey leaves and Adam starts to wonder what Jonathan's problem is. Yeah, I think he suggests that Jonathan might be in the need of female companionship and he then advises him on how to pull. Yeah, bit. well he opens up by saying maybe he's jealous of Joey, he's struggling because she's smart and bright and articulate. And I think there might well be a point there. Absolutely. But... Um, also, it might just be because he, he hasn't enjoyed himself at night recently. With someone else. Yeah. He demonstrates his uh, technique. Yeah, that's not going to work, is it? It looks a bit creepy, to be honest. Yeah, it looks like Mrs... What was, his, what was her name? Mrs Thrimble, who went into a catatonic state a few weeks ago. <laughs> yes. He describes his um, technique of making women feel like he is going to care for them and not I don't even understand what he was talking no, about. It was, garbage. It, was it garbage. It was garbage. It was that stuff. What do you call it? What is that repulsive book? The the game or ah yeah, Neil Strauss's uh, right. pickup artistry. Yeah. Garbage. Uh -huh. He's probably a meninist. Shh, no doubt. <laughs> or what are they called now? Um, incels. That'd be more Jonathan because I think Adam does get a bit. Yes, yeah, so Jonathan. I don't think Jonathan's quite got the bigotry to be an incel. No, yeah, we'll, we'll not get to that. You can Google that if you're wanting to be disturbed. Jonathan, however, appears has taken on board Adam's advice because we next see him at a bus stop. Yeah, despite his protestations, yeah, he uses the eyes. He does. He, he sees Emily looking for, I think, a taxi as he waits for his bus. And 
their eyes meet and there's a, a smile of connection there. Yeah, she kind of blushes a little bit and we cut away to the theatre where Joey is performing at the top of her game. Yeah, so it looks like it's been a, a successful evening. And this is a bit, this is one of the problems I had. We we head over to a hotel room. I assume, yes, it's a hotel. Yes. Or a motel, motel, probably. <laughs> the Emily and Jonathan are hooking up. They are. She's well out of his league. Now, I can accept that Jonathan Creek could become a bit of a sex symbol because of his brains and his intelligence. Yes. But that's something that you need, that develops over time. You have to know the person. You become attracted to the other aspects of, of, of his being. Jonathan Creek ain't pulling someone like Emily just by a glance at to the uh, the bus stop. But you have to take into account the fact that her self-esteem is low. She is maybe starved of positive attention living in that house. Maybe, but... And, maybe she, and she's also a believer in fate and destiny based on things that have happened to her. But that was just someone she saw at a bus stop. There was yeah. no interaction. Like It wasn't like uh, he... You know, she went, to, she tripped over and he helped her or some something that... Maybe he said something particularly insightful or charming. No, he was using Adam's pattern. Yeah, but after that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I just think that, yeah, she, he's done well for himself there. Yeah, well. Anyway, having operated faster than a, a speeding bullet, Jonathan is on the bed and kissing the, the lovely Emily. And as he goes to the, the, the bathroom to clean out his ears, uh, Emily discusses life and love. And how she doesn't like... Tongues in years. I think Jonathan was a bit disappointed by that. I think that's one of those disclaimers that probably aren't necessary, just don't do it. Yeah. You don't need to announce in advance. No. Of all the things you do need to announce in advance, that's not top yeah. of the list. You're not just going to shoot surprise and that you're <laughs> talking somebody's ear. That's... Unless it was more popular back in those days than I remember. Maybe in a fad. In any case, she also warns him about something a little bit more severe. She may wake up in the middle of the night screaming. And she recounts the story that we saw at the beginning of the episode, her in the, the, the field with the disappearing house. Yes, and Jonathan's inflated ego now starts to make an appearance. She, however, goes on to discuss how she went from working in a shoe shop to now working at, or for, Hugo, and the strange story of, of his house. Yeah, but she also talks about the strange stories of her life and how these things have happened to her before. Yeah, and as you say, Jonathan, immediately his ego immediately leaves him to assume that she knows who he is and she is only after him for his insight and problem-solving abilities. And why would he even have a problem with that if she was? Exactly. That's his, John, <laughs> you're, you're a mug. If she want, if she's offering her body for your mind, that's a fair swap, son. Yeah, I mean, uh, given the fact that he's got to this stage already, yeah. he's obviously prepared to take further steps, but mm -hmm. not if she wants his knowledge. Well, he's not a prostitute. <laughs> I do not exchange problem solving for Anyway He is very rude to her um, or A couple of times And she freaks out and leaves yeah, Quite rightly says I think I better leave yeah. And does And he's left with the bill for the hotel room Quite rightly That's what you get Yes Back at Green Lanterns And after collecting the mail Emily spots Harriet snooping in Hugo's study And finding a, a piece of paper Yes it's taken from a drawer and, and hidden under a, or in a notebook, I think. Harriet then tells Emily that she has to check the post for an absent neighbour and hands her the keys to the house as she opens a letter. What does it contain? It contains a handwritten note. What type of note? A death threat. Oh, tell me about it. It's signed Selena, but it's in Emily's handwriting. Spooky. Yeah, how would they even do that? That wasn't explained, was it? There's no moment where we see them seeing her handwriting, it wouldn't nope. be part of her job. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. I'm sure I mean, she might have signed a contract, but even She doesn't then, deny it's her handwriting though. Exactly. I mean, if I had been accused of writing a, a letter, I'd say, give me that right now. And I'd be saying, no, that's not, that's definitely not my writing. Yeah. Even if it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Emily strongly denies, however, that she wrote the note. What did the note say? Can you remember? I can't remember word for word. I think it called her a loathsome bitch and claiming she will be dead in three days. Fair enough. Yeah. And Emily notes that this was the name of the mysterious woman from the past. It does seem that Emily has persuaded Harriet that it's not her, or she didn't send it because she allows her to continue to work, which you would not be doing if you thought someone wanted to kill you. Correct. And also from the other perspective, if 
someone had accused me of writing a death threat, I don't think I would continue to work for them if I thought that they've suspected me. Yeah, it would be awkward, wouldn't it? Very. Especially on the dinner table. <laughs> so she's in the neighbour's house. After opening the door, picks up the mail. I think there's a, there's a tension, there's an atmosphere. Yeah, well, there's ghosts all around, I could see. Of course. Or something that looks like ghosts, I couldn't tell. Back over to the rehearsal hall, where an enthused Joey arrives with ideas of improving the show, but Jonathan and Adam, and Adam are more concerned about Adam now being a, a CGI YouTube star. What's been going on here? Yeah, well, Adam says he's woken up in a Kafka novel. For anyone who doesn't know that reference, that's a, a combination of the real and the fantastic, so he mm. thinks things have gone a bit crazy. Uh, the magic relief gaff has been seized on by internet satirists, and now this is the sort of thing that is just now becoming real, where there's like you're putting somebody else's face on a video. So I think they're a bit premature with the technology here. Yeah, I mean, I think you could maybe do it back then, but it would be the, the, the big studios who would have the resources. I don't think your average YouTube uh, punter it would have. No. I mean, even last year, they struggled to take a moustache off a man <laughs> in a major movie. So for this YouTube video, you've got Adam dressed as Hitler um, replacing Adam in his normal outfit whilst making his comments in Africa. Just then... Joey takes a, a massively coincidental call from Emily, who is talking about the weird encounter that she just had with the man from the bus stop. So, I think what's happened here is Emily has got in touch with Joey via her website. Yes. And they either have already spoke or met. Either or she's bought some 3D printed objects that are very useful. <laughs> they certainly have been over the whole story and there's more. Tell me. So Emily's phoning to say she was down by the woodshed. She says the other day, so she's obviously not that bothered. But anyway, she looked inside and it was green and eerie. Mm -hmm. And on the logs, she saw the face of Selima. Oh. In fairness, what you just said there um, about the other day not being that bothered, I think uh, uh, Joey apologises and says that she'd been busy with Adam's show, so I think she'd arranged to meet up. Right. Okay, fair enough. Also, a... Uh, Emily now has a copy of a hidden map, which was the document we saw Harriet hiding away ah, earlier. Okay. We cut to Emily and Joey. I think they're in Joey's car outside Green Lanterns yeah, with this piece of paper that Harriet was hiding. Joey's going to follow this map and see where it leads. I think there's a reference to Dumb Woman's Lane. Yeah, that's the name of the street where the map begins. Yeah. In the countryside, after following the directions on the map, Joey ends up in a grass clearing Looking at a solitary tree. Did you see Joey's necklace? Uh, maybe. It looked like skeletons and top hats, but loads of them. Yeah, I quite liked it. Okay. And as she inspects it, she sees Harriet approaching and quickly hides. Harriet would definitely have seen her there. Yeah, there's no way that she didn't get spotted. Yeah, because she's in the middle of an open field. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she does hide and she watches as Harriet does something to the base of the tree. We can't see what. Well, once she's gone, Joey goes to investigate. But finds nothing. Nothing obvious anyway. No. So we're over at Joey's house. I think it's Joey's house. Is Joey's house? I thought it was backstage at the theatre or something. Anyway, Jonathan's on a laptop. Joey's talking. Yeah, she's dressed as a fairy. Yeah, she's not happy. She'd rather be an imp. <laughs> and she is discussing the case with Jonathan, who pretends to be uninterested in the mystery. Although his ears prick up when he hears the, the source's name. Yeah, I think he's figuring out who this source is, and it's mm. the woman from the bus stop. Yeah, but as he ponders this, he is distracted by Adam's attempt to salvage his reputation by making a response video from his dressing room whilst applying some stage makeup. Tell me about this. It's a cringeworthy apology video where he says his life's goal has been to entertain people of all creeds and colours while he's putting on his makeup and then... Someone's edited this video to make it look like he's putting on blackface. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's effective and it's obviously been not done by CGI that he's actually filmed this. Of course. Over in Emily's bedroom, as she gets changed for the night, she gets, and again we get her in her, it's David Rennick here. Now this whole scene, she's in her lingerie, which is completely unnecessary. Yeah, I'm not complaining, but... She should be happy at least if she's kept it on, I suppose. Yeah. So in her lingerie, she gets terrified by an old painting which now has her face on it as opposed to Salima's 
And at that, the lights go out along with uh, a pop. And then I think we see some glass cutting her feet. Yes. He's Hugo hurries in to help her, making sure he gets a hug. Oh, yes. Give me a little comfort you, yeah. And at this, uh, at the Kenzian, Mrs. Gantry appears to see what the fuss is. Now, Hugo calms things down by saying that it's just a blown fuse. And Emily tells them that the, the painting was the thing that upset her the most. But when Harriet arrives in the scene with a torch, they look at the painting and what's happened. I, I initially thought, what is she coming in with a torch for? But I assume that the lights have gone out throughout the house. Yeah. I it's not that. obvious because we're in one room. But yeah. They must have all gone out. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the, the painting. Well, it was. The, it's not a painting. It was a photograph, wasn't it? Yeah, photograph, so it was yeah. Selena. And then... When Emily looked at it, it was her own face, mm -hmm. but now it's back to what it was originally. Mm -hmm. This causes the distressed Emily to doubt herself, but things take a, another turn for the worse, as before they leave, Harriet sees a letter addressed to her, poking out of Emily's bag. Yes, she takes it and opens it, and it says, beware the approach of ISIS. <laughs> so it's obviously <laughs> about global news. <laughs> yeah. The next morning... Emily opens the door to Joey and a now very sheepish Jonathan, who at least admits that he was an arse. But she hasn't told him to, to bugger off. So now round the table, he has his initial say on the matter. Obviously you're going to be in massive nerves. Who wouldn't? With all the madness that's going on around here. Insecurities and play havoc with your mental health. As I unfortunately managed to demonstrate, not very thoughtfully, the other night. What he's trying to say is, he's such an anally fixated bigot, he thought the only reason you wanted him was for his world famous powers of deduction, as opposed to his charming personality and animal magnetism. <laughs> but look, come on, we've got to hang in here and not just go imagining this woman somehow taking over your mind, making you write those weird notes and whatever. That's just horror story time, it's not real. Sometimes I think my whole life is a horror story. That house that just disappeared. The man in the grass. It's like... Maybe I can see things sometimes that aren't there anymore. You know, the mystery of the vanishing cottage may be the least challenging of this whole puzzle. And when you stop and think about it, the man in the grass will be part of the only explanation that could possibly fit. But he's not going to tell us. No. Because Harriet interrupts at this point and introduces herself to the visitors and tells Emily that she's got work to do. Quite right. This is, yeah, she's getting paid. Yeah, you can't just have your friends around for a chat. No. Especially when you've been <laughs> writing poison pen letters to your employer. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. So later... They meet with the, the friendlier, on the surface of it anyway, Hugo, who is pleased to have Jonathan in his family home. I think he is aware of who he is. Yeah, he says they plough similar furrows. Mm. Now, knowing what we, we know, they can't be happy with Jonathan being there. No, I would imagine they maybe need to up their game. Yeah. They talk about the mystery of Thaddeus' death and Jonathan makes it clear that he knows this whole story. Yes, but he also says that this is where he and his brother grew up before he left for overseas. Hugo says this. Yeah. Yes. And Hugo has also read Selena's memoir, which she apparently wrote after the murder. Mm -hmm. But there's no clues, he thinks. No, I think he describes it as a, an absolute classic mystery. Jonathan at this stage spots and spends some time looking at what appears to be a um, dark blowing pipe on the mantelpiece. And Joey asks about Isis, and Hugo says that she's a, an Egyptian fertility goddess, before telling Jonathan that the, the blowgun was found in the attic. So yeah. it's obviously been around since the, the incident. Yeah, it's not something he's brought back from his travels. It, he says it dates back to the property's earliest owners, though how he established that is not clear. No. And he also says it's not a, 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 a blowgun, it's a, a reed instrument. Yeah. After Hugo leaves, Jonathan claims that the dust on what they think might be a gun, a blowgun, reveal that it has been recently removed and tampered with. So, hmm. Yeah. Outside, as they ponder who could be behind the threats, 
on the way to the woodshed, they are watched by a, a priest. I would say a Hitchcock-esque priest. Yes, a Father Albrecht. Yes, and Mrs Gantry greets him. He's early. In the woodshed, Joey comes up with a, a reasonable but maybe overly complicated solution to the ghostly vision. Yeah, Pepper's Ghost, mm? I think it was called. Okay, tell me. It's a trick which involved an angled piece of glass projecting this ghostly image. And it had been patented, Jonathan says, in the late 19th century. But where, um, so two things about this is that uh, from where Emily was standing, you wouldn't need all these uh, angles and glass. You could just project something onto you Yeah, it's, projector. it's 2010. Use a projector. Yeah. But what is another issue I have here is, this plot is riddled with them, but if she'd simply walked through to have a look, yeah. the game's up. Yes. So how would they know that she wouldn't? I mean, I, I think I would, because I, I, I'd assume to myself... Yeah, because later on we see her in a similar situation where she does walk in. Yeah, so she's not obviously terrified. No. Ah, bold. Mm, stupid. Yes. Chancy. Very. We see the priest sneezing after picking up the, the cat, uh, the family cat that is, and takes tea with the gantry in the garden. And back in the woodshed, descending through the trap door, Joey accidentally... <laughs> Traps him down there for five and a half hours. Yeah, Father Albert says he's got an early malignancy. That's cancer, right? Yeah, I'm not a qualified doctor, so I wouldn't like to say. But the response from Mrs. Gantry is, well, apart from that, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Quite matter of fact. Yes, Jonathan fails to heed the warning of um, children's television and looks under the trap door. Yes, indeed. Joey follows him down and just as Jonathan warns her not to do anything silly, she causes the trapdoor to close on top of them and be covered by the logs. Mm. They do, however, find the sheet of glass that she had supposed would be there. Yeah, this is another scene that's slightly truncated on Netflix. So if you're watching on Netflix, you won't have seen Jonathan try to open the trapdoor. Mm -hmm. But he does. It's a few seconds. It's nothing. Yeah. I'm glad. I mean, that should have been cut because we, we saw the, the wood falling on it. So we knew that Jonathan wouldn't be able to shift yeah, that. Yeah, it doesn't add anything. No. He's quite happy, however, because he's got Salima's diary. Yes, he settles down to read it with his torch. How long his battery's going to last? Not very long at all. I wouldn't be using it on reading. No. And this, he adds to Joey's discomfort by reminding her how much coffee she has already drunk. <laughs> I think that line might have been out in Netflix as well. That's okay. a slightly truncated scene. Sure. Before we head out to the garden, we see Harriet and Emily discuss linen inside. Whilst outside, Gantry complains to Alberic that... She doesn't need any help running the household. Yeah, she thinks things are going to end in tears the way they're going. Yeah. I think, I think she says to him that uh, she'll be fit enough to buff up his pews. Yes, he's a, he actually asks her to come over and do that. Ah. There's also a little clue there as well. Is there? Well, Gantry is capable of running the household. So why do they need to bring someone in? Back out in the woodshed, Joey is now bored. Yes, she moans a bit and asks Jonathan what he's learned from the book and he says nothing, but maybe the photos inside will prove useful at some point. That's not very helpful. No. He wonders a bit about the scream. I wondered if the scream was covering another noise. Yeah. Which would make much more sense than what it was. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan agrees with Hugo's theory that Selena almost certainly left a cryptic clue in the book. And yes, and points Joey to the dedication. With thanks to HCN, none but we may know. That seems a bit obvious. Yeah, you wouldn't write that in your book, would you? Yes. I killed him. <laughs> it's like OJ's book. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Jonathan tells her that Northcott's wife was called Helen. And Joey asks if he thinks that the two women were in it together. But his focus is shifted as he is bursting for the toilet and realises that Joey has been sitting on bags of cat litter, which will do the trick. Absolutely. Was that in the Netflix version? Yes. Good. Back up in the garden. While Gantry gets more tea, Alberic confesses that his only vice is a carpentry one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Jonathan, meanwhile, having thought a bit about coffee, suddenly realises the problem with Isis. It's that there was no plan for the end of the conflict when they invaded Iraq. No, what it actually reveals is that Harriet has only one minute left to live. Yes. ISIS being numbers and not words. 
Correct. Back up in the garden, we get a quick shot of the microwave clock turning to 15, 15, quarter past three. And then from outside, all three witness Harriet struggling with an unseen person up at her bedroom window before falling to a very gruesome death impaled on the spikes of a railing. That's right. Did you think it was a bit odd how Hugo reacted? Yeah, it was a little bit unbalanced, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, he runs over to Harriet and lifts her off the the spikes. That's bad planning. You don't touch any sort of victim, really. Especially ones with puncture wounds. Yeah, you want to keep everything plugged up as best you can. Yeah, but my first reaction would be someone, I'd be phoning 999 myself, or at least demanding someone does. But he, he does, doesn't. he says to the father. No, he runs over. He grabs Harriet first, he removes her from the spikes and brings her over and puts her in a, a, a garden... Uh, lounger. Lounger. Yeah. That's not what you do first of all. You no. get the ambulance on the way. It's unusual behaviour. Very odd behaviour. Things get odder however. When asked who did it, what does Harriet do and say? She points at uh, Emily who's just returning to the garden from having put the bins out. and She says she wasn't even there. But Harriet reveals in her hand critical piece of evidence. What's that? Part of the dress that Emily's wearing. Yeah, but not only that, she pointed right at her and says she killed me or she did it. Yeah, her last words are, Emily, she murdered me. Hmm. It's fairly persuasive. A deathbed fingering. Still quite uh, popular. Mm-hmm. With Jimmy Savile. <laughs> I really need to stop the Jimmy Savile jokes. You do. It's and not even topical anymore. You have to anymore. cut these out every week. Yeah. Oh, am I meant to cut these out? Yeah. You're not. <clears throat> Hugo tells Mrs Gantry to take Emily away and he begins to become a bit emotional now. Yeah. Things start to hit him, maybe. Sometime later, the cops are there and the body is being removed. As statements are being taken, what happens to Emily? What's she do? She sneaks off and runs to the neighbouring house that she had the keys for. This is all a bit silly. You really look guilty here if you're... It's not even, you're not even hiding very well. You're just went yeah. right next door. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in the neighbour's house... She hears a noise from upstairs and in true horror movie fashion decides to investigate. We get a brief cutaway where a police officer is seen looking for her and hears Joey shouting from the woodshed. Under the bathroom door, she hears and sees feet walking and so opens it up to find the room empty but blood pooled in the sink and as she stumbles backwards out of the door, She's grabbed, or certainly found. It's just a police officer though, it's not a monster. It would be better off being a monster. She's, yeah. in, she's in trouble now. She definitely is. Because we next see her in prison. Where Jonathan is holding her hand as she tells him and Joey what has been happening. They had one of those, like, police shrinks in here this morning. Reckons I'm distorting things in my mind. Blocking out what happened because I can't bear to face it. What do you think, Jonathan? You believe I killed her? I think that's what someone wants us to believe. And they've gone to a hell of a lot of trouble to put this case together very convincingly. Somehow we've got to prise it apart. And it's not impossible. The weirdest things sometimes that don't add up once they're explained. That cottage you saw and then didn't see, you've had a thought. Never mind how unlikely the thought. Just run with the sheer cold of analysis. A building cannot disappear. It can't even seem to disappear. But what looks like a building that can seem to disappear, that could have been placed in that field deliberately, in the middle of nowhere, for a purpose that's unlikely to occur to any of us. They do like a bit of flashback in Jonathan Creek. We get some here, which explains the, the vanishing house. Tell us. It appears to be, in Jonathan's mind, a facade for a movie of a house mm -hmm. that's fallen on top of this poor man in the grass. Yeah, I mean, we saw it at the very start. It was a very windy, blusterous day. This has caused the, this facade to fall over and crush the man. Yeah, I don't believe this is true. She would no. have seen that. You'd have seen the back of the facade lying in the ground. Mm -hmm. She went over. Yeah, she went quite near it. Yeah. Because it would have... Because you've got all this tall grass and then you would have a flat area. Yeah, but not only that, it was like a double-storey house. The stanchions at the back 
would have been fairly high up. So yeah. when that toppled over, he would have there would be spikes there would be the yeah. east engine would be sticking out it's far more likely it was like a shadow or something that she saw far more likely she's just a murderer you know, she, yeah or she made the whole thing up yeah to just take attention I mean. anyway Emily's not convinced either no she says they'll never know and Joey's like oh no we do know Jonathan's just exp-, but he gets her to back do we're at the church now briefly for the funeral of Harry we're after the service and outside Mrs Gantry Tells Joey and Jonathan that Hugo is thinking of selling up and moving back to the Far East. She also has some other news. Yeah, Harriet was two months pregnant when she died. Ah. Which appears to have been a shock for Hugo. That's maybe why he's thinking of Mm -hmm. moving on. We head over to Father Alberic's house workshop. Rectory, maybe. Where uh, Jonathan and Joey find him working with a very unusual piece. I like the fact that Oh, sorry, he's stuck inside a coffin that he's building around himself. Yeah, his own coffin. Yeah. I think he's put a bit of weight on and yeah, from he's when he started struggling a little bit, yeah. Um, I like the fact he identifies with Joey. He recognises her. He's a fan of her work and he uh, praises her for what she did on the Grinning Man case. Yeah, Jonathan is not overly delighted with that, or her, with her taking all the credit. No, he, he calls it a masterclass in ratiocination. What's that? I was going to ask you what that is. Is that rationalisation? No, it's a different word, ratiocination. Okay. Let's look it up. Okay, what does it mean? It's kind of rational or train of thought. Rationalisation, that's what I said. Nah, I'm not sure it is. Anyway, it's all about context. Jonathan's doubly upset when Alberic refers to him as her Dr. Watson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he pulls out a drill. <laughs> <laughs> the priest, however, goes on to confirm what he saw happen on the day of the, the murder. He heard noises and saw Harriet pushed and Emily was the only other person around the house at the time. Jonathan then thumbs through Alberic's annotated copy of Salima's book and Alberic tells him that Helen Northcott's middle name was Catherine. Joey thinks this is it. They've solved it. HCN. Yep, Helen Catherine Northcott. She also wonders if they maybe have already seen the instrument of death. Yes, she suggests the the blowpipe as a, a silent weapon. However, Alberic states what Jonathan already knew. The item was far too short to be a blowpipe and uh, there were no signs of puncture marks on the body. Additionally, Catherine was spelled with a K. It does however seem that Alberic has been a bit of a sleuth on this. He's been investigating the case for quite some time. Yeah, he's quite an impressive chap. He does however concede that when he was there for the funeral arrangements, he noticed that the pipe was missing and during this time Hugo seemed concerned about accounting for his sins and, in fact, requested confession at the church. Yes, but Father Albrecht had to leave at that stage because the cat appeared. Yes, but he did turn up, Hugo that is, for confession the next morning. Of course, Albrecht can't say what he was told. Yeah, of course, there's an expectation of privacy. Yeah, and also the fact that he fell asleep. And he has no idea what was said. <laughs> There's a bit of a, what's the right word, convoluted way to get Joey's phone into the hands of Father Albrecht here. What was that? It rings and he goes to get it and it rings off. Yeah. And he notices on her screen a picture of the tree. Yes. Which he informs them was the variety, I think that's the right word, I'm not sure, that Judas supposedly hanged himself from after his betrayal. Ah, okay. Is that a real thing? It's a real made up story. No, I mean the tree. Is it a real type of tree? Yeah, it will be. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. I assume it is. Okay. We skip forward a couple of weeks. Must be a couple of weeks. Very speedy. Yeah, very very quickly Emily's been brought to trial. <laughs> yeah, justice is very the swift, swift these hand days. of the law, <laughs> yes. Gantry we see is giving evidence and is being led into suggesting that Emily may have had designs on Hugo, therefore providing a motive for the killing. We also hear Hugo and Alberic providing evidence that it doesn't look very good for her. No, and Emily's hopes are further squashed when the judge refers to her as the pigeon murderer of Flanders. (laughs) Over at the neighbour's house, as they approach, Jonathan remarks to Joey that the case has echoes of old movies and that Hugo's novels themselves weren't that original. Yeah, he refers to the shining and to gaslight. I didn't necessarily spot the... No, I'm not, certainly here. the shining, I'm not sure what the connection would be. Father Albrecht, as we've said before, has to go about the Hitchcocks about him, so maybe there's 
an attempt to have a theme running here. Mm. Inside, Joey offers another reasonable hypothesis about Hugo murdering his wife and framing Emily before asking Jonathan why they're there in the first place. He wants to try and reenact what Emily would have seen. Yes, and specifically how a person could easily have disappeared from the room and he shows that it is easy to do. Yeah, as long as the person who walks into the room only looks straight ahead. And doesn't have ears. Yes. Because that would be a creaky old house, I'd imagine. Uh, uh, it wouldn't work the way they suggest. Anyway. However, he does admit that the person would have had no idea that Emily would have ended up there. Yeah, so something else must be going on. Mm-hmm. They split up at this stage to forage around the house for clues. And downstairs, Jonathan hides when he hears Hugo enter and he sees him go upstairs and return very quickly. Did you like Jonathan's hiding place? Where was that again? He pretended to be a ghost. Oh yeah, he yeah, it was quite nice. He just stood in the hall with a sheet over his head. <laughs> yeah. So he goes upstairs to try to work out what Hugo was there for and finds that Joey has managed to get herself stuck in a, a massive urn-like vessel. Yes, he recognises that she's in it but then stops listening as she struggles to escape because something else catches his attention. Yes, he discovers what we think is the, the blowpipe and he picks it up whilst calling it fascinating and having a, a eureka moment whilst recalling the scream in the garden. Yes, and the blown light bulb and the HCN. Yeah. Joey then releases herself from her predicament in a last of the summer wine fashion. Yeah, well, Jonathan finally responds to her, takes the lid off, but can't pull her out. At this stage, there's a comedy tumble down the stairs in what looks like a paper mache version of the giant pot. Yeah. And it shatters at the, the foot of the stairs. Surely it would have shattered bouncing on the stairs as well. You'd have thought so. In any event, Joey's out. She is, and she asks him what he has learned, and he reminds her of something that he found out about Northcott. He was friends with someone called, I think it was Sir Francis Galton. Yes, the man who invented the dog whistle. <laughs> They're very useful, and you see them all the time now, don't you? No, but I do remember one time being a, a brat of a kid, and my next door neighbour had a, a large, I think it might have been a Doberman. Right. And I stood outside the house and blew it, thinking... I think it was now, like, Urwelly. Yeah, you know, reading these comics, happened. I'll try this myself, but not thinking it would work, and going to the local pet shop and buying one. <laughs> and then a chap at the door later from the irate neighbour and get me, get me into trouble. That's unfortunate. Yeah. You don't just say it wasn't you. I was standing at our front window. <laughs> <laughs> Doing this. <laughs> uh, anyway, where were we? I think we're going to court. We are. It is now Jonathan's turn to take the witness stand and he uses it to bring everyone up to speed by telling them what has happened before offering a solution. The possible trigger that could have caused his death at exactly 3.15 the moment it was predicted. It's just a high-pitched, blood-curdling scream that came from the bushes. No significance to that, fairly obviously, unless that scream was not a reaction, but the instrument of murder itself. A scream that set in motion something so lethal that it could kill within seconds and then disappear, quite literally, into thin air. Hydrogen cyanide, HCN could be pumped into a small airtight container and then sealed with a piece of glass known to shatter at a certain frequency. Guilty. Yeah, there's no way. That's just such a terrible theory. Horrible. I mean, why, what's he doing standing up with this gobbledygook? Whose idea was it to put him on the witness stand as well? What's he doing in court? I want to know what the defence lawyer is all about here. It's obviously desperate. The defence lawyer for a start should have made a connection with Hugo and his past and worked out there's, a, you know, there's something to be looked at there. He's but perhaps struggling because he's been forced to come to court less than two weeks after the murder. Yes. He's had no chance to interview <laughs> anybody or make preparation. Yeah. But the whole thing there, I mean, Jonathan says, oh yeah, of course, uh, Salima would require some expert help to, to put this plan together. Of course, how would... No. You have to speak to someone who can provide you with HCN... 
and then get it into a watch. You're going to have to make special glass for that very specific watch. You're going to have to get his watch off him. Fill it with the yeah, poison stuff. Take it stuff. away for a day or two or whatever it is so someone can make the glass. Fill it with poison. Give- no, that's absolute tripe. Yeah, no, I call BS on this theory. Big time. That's not what she did. That's not how he died. And also, screaming at a particular frequency. You can't scream no, at a particular but, frequency. If you ask. I don't know. You, you, otherwise, people's watches would be shattering all the time. No, that was special glass. Uh, they would crack at that, that frequency. frequency. Yeah. Was it tuned to her voice? Who knows? It's just nonsense. I mean, you can. Some of the, the I think the top is it soprano singers can hit notes high enough that very, very fine glass can actually shatter. Okay. But but no, she's no. Not, not from that distance outside. No, not having it. No. As you might expect, Jonathan's evidence crumbles under cross-examination. He also mentions that the inspiration for this plan would have came from a, a pipe, a prototype ultrasonic whistle. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. This is not evidence to start with. Uh, it's not even a good theory. He continues, however. It gets worse. He says that this is how Hugo would have shattered his specially made light bulb <laughs> in Emily's room and talks about the, the Scooby-Doo style painting swaps or picture swapping. Oh, that's ridiculous. The whole thing he suggests, is a campaign against Emily. Yeah, again, it gets even worse. He talks about the apparitions in the woodshed and the forged letters that were a, a, a deliberate effort to, as part of this uh, this campaign. Yeah, and as I said, the, the prosecution solicitor has no difficulty in putting him on the spot. Yes, he simply asks, who pushed Harriet? Everyone else was in the garden watching this. Yeah, apart from Emily. Yes. And, and, and not only that, Harriet said it was Emily. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what does, how does Jonathan answer this one? Oh, uh, Harriet saw what she expected to see. It was, it was quite dark. It was a silhouette. This is... No, it's not as dark. The sun's shining from oh, right, behind so her, yes. so she can't make out who the person is. But because of the letter, she's been primed to expect an attack from Emily. I'm embarrassed for Jonathan here, standing up, trying to spout this. Yes. It's terrible. He shouldn't have been allowed. It's horrible. Put in that position. Yeah, it should like any defence lawyer would have said, okay, what are we going to say here? Yeah, no, absolutely. If and you practice, what's the cross-examination? How do you answer? It's not sprung on you. So after this, we see the jury return with the very correct guilty verdict based on the evidence and ignoring Jonathan's bullshit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Drowning the pub. Yeah, drowning their sorrows. Joey reads a newspaper article mocking Jonathan's very unhelpful turn giving evidence. Jonathan agrees, though, that what he came up with wasn't close to explaining what happened. No, he says it was a cobbled together guff. Yes, and he says that Dory is clever. Yes, not only clever, but a borderline psychopath and epic genius. <laughs> Joey, however, has an alternative theory. What's that? That Emily did it. Yep, and I think that should be very, very seriously considered. Yeah, and Jonathan's only reason for not believing that is that she was prepared to sleep with him. Yeah. If she'd ignored him at the bus stop, he wouldn't be feeling this way. No, he's at it. Yeah. However, I think Joey is empathetic to his emotions and so offers her support and asks him okay what other you know what other avenues are we going to explore then they head back to the dory house mm. but sorry I, I think it's worth saying i think that's a nice little character development there it'd be easy yeah to for him just for her just to refuse to work or fall out with him say like you're ignoring the, the obvious here but it shows that she has a, a considerate and compassionate side to her yeah fair enough I don't, I, I don't think we would suggest she wasn't compassionate at any stage no but considering how even in this episode, Jonathan's treated her. Yeah, that's true. With, yes. with, and her. in the previous episode, her friend died and she was over it really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, back over to Green Lanterns. Yeah, Jonathan sees a spoon and suddenly has solved the case. Firstly, tell me, set the scene. They're in the Dory Garden. It's night time. And Jonathan says, he's looking for a glimmer. And he sees a glimmer on the ground. And it's the moon reflecting on a spoon. <laughs> so he goes down and he, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he sees that from that table he makes this weird comment i didn't get i don't know if it was just cut out of netflix or if it was out we didn't know what table they were sitting at yeah i think it's uh, the position in the garden yeah so, but they've never addressed that previously there's not a scene where he sits at the other table and says they would have seen this no i, I don't think anyone thought that what table they were sitting at was relevant okay because of what you could see yeah exactly okay. yeah exactly so it was never been, that's his point is it's never been discussed it no one really thought, should have been not really 
And, 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 and I, no, I don't think so. I don't think. And, okay. um, also, only, so only in the land of murder mysteries. It's not so much what they would have seen as what they wouldn't have seen as well. Yeah. So he's convinced now he knows exactly what happened and he knows who was washing their hands in the bathroom. They then hide as they see Hugo place a, a case in the boot of his car and inspect a syringe. That's the type of thing you do inside. You don't yeah. wait until you get outside then. It's, it's a comical syringe as well. It's yeah. huge. Well, it would need to be huge when we find out what it's doing. Yes, it's <laughs> sedating an elephant. <laughs> he takes this uh, syringe with him and drives off. Yeah, we see him drive right up to this tree. Yes, the, the Judas tree. That we they had to walk through the woods to get to. Yeah. But well. he drives up and parks next to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they followed him and find him with his case at the, the foot yeah. of the tree. And they're standing there pointing their torch and he doesn't notice them. No. And as they're watching him, who is watching them? Someone's putting a torch on them and we get a point of view shot and it's Harriet! Oh. It's alive! We didn't see that coming. That was a twist. Yeah. Uh, she brings him to Hugo. Yes. Now this is one of these situations again where if they perhaps not considered that these people could be murderers, are murderers, yep. they might just kill us in the middle of a dark field here. Well, they think they conclude that they are murderers. Yeah. Murderers? But they are murderers. Yeah, but she's not got a gun or anything. She leads them up to Hugo. At that point, I would be, if you're worried, you think, oh, I'm out here. He pulls out his giant syringe, sticks <laughs> yeah. them with it. Uh, Jonathan notes at this stage that they've pulled off a staggering deception and put an innocent young woman in jail. Yeah, and Joy reveals her outstanding curiosity as to the significance of the tree. Yeah, Jonathan thinks he knows this one as well. They're just concerned for its welfare. <laughs> yeah, because we see, I, I, we've got more flashback again, and we see what Harriet was doing uh, a few weeks ago. When yeah, she was saw. injecting, probably, I think, platelets into the tree. Yeah, and Jonathan says that if not for the location of the tree itself, he would have thought that one of them had planted it. That doesn't so. make sense either. I, I suppose he's saying if they had planted it, they would have planted it in their own garden, as opposed to they couldn't have planted a tree here. Well, I think it's, you, yeah, if, if it was your own tree you would in your own garden, then it's reasonable for you to look after it. But yeah. they know that it's not their tree, so why are they looking after it? That's it. And Joey says it's like leaving flowers by the road when there's been an accident. Yeah, she senses a, a personal connection to it. And we find out exactly what when Hugo speaks up. And again, through flashback, we return to Emily and her friend all those years ago. So explain what we see. Okay, we start off, Hugo tells a story about his older brother, but who had a reduced mental capacity. He was, had the mental age, it was much younger. So he talks about what a privilege it was to grow up with him, but that he was out there in a world that he couldn't deal with. I think he's in his 20s or so, and he's out driving his convertible BMW, seems to be living quite the life. And he stops because there's a woman on the road. Mm -hmm. That was Emily's friend. Yes, Emily's injured her ankle apparently, so this fellow goes over there and the, the other friend tries to steal his car, but he's got the keys on him. So Emily still takes the keys from his pocket? Yeah, and I think he thinks it's a game. Yeah, but then there's a bit of a struggle. So what happens? Well, it's not really a struggle. He thinks she's playing with him. He tries to get the keys back. Yeah. He's smiling and laughing. And the other friend sneaks up behind him and kills him with a rock. Severely bashes him around the head, Gessler style. Yeah, or worse. Oh, it was horrific. Yeah. Although... He doesn't die straight away. It's, it's well, even worse than that. Yeah, we don't really see him alive again, but they bury him under some leaves. At the, where the tree now is. Where the tree now is. And we learn from Hugo mm -hmm. that he lived long enough that when he was found, he was able to give evidence. Yeah. Deathbed evidence. But then died. Yes. The girls were picked up for this. They're going to court. Yeah. And we interpreted this slightly differently. My interpretation was... They claimed self-defence that this guy with the diminished capacity had attacked them and they had no option but to fight him off and he died in that struggle. Yeah, I mean, I may have missed that uh, whilst taking notes, but yeah, I, I thought they basically had just said, well, no, it wasn't, that wasn't us, we're two nice young girls and the court says, ah, you just don't look the sort. In any event, they were acquitted and that was frustrating for Hugo. It would be. A couple, uh, of, a couple of scumbags. Yeah. Uh, according if his version of this tale is true. Well, that's the thing. So we're getting, yeah. is it a reliable narrator? We don't mm. know. But anyway, according to his version, this is what happened. So at this, Joey starts to put things together and Harriet admits 
to the acts of revenge. We hear that Emily's friend was marked for death and that they also intended to send Emily herself to prison for life. So with the aid of more flashback, Jonathan explains how it was pulled off and how the blood ended up in the neighbour's sink. Can you tell us about that? Okay, so they've kidnapped the other girl that they intend to kill and they've kept her in the bunker. Uh -huh. Although we saw no clues to that when Jonathan and Joy were in the bunker mm -hmm. that you might expect to see. Um, additionally, she must have been down there when they were doing the projection of the woman onto the logs. Mm-hmm. That's weird. Yeah. Anyway, so they've kept her down there up until this night and they have dressed her as Harriet and chucked her out the window. Yeah. Onto she, the spikes. And so she would have been alive when she was thrown out on yes, the spikes. Yeah. she was alive. And then they lift her, um, Hugo's lifted her off the spikes and done a switch mm -hmm. with the real Harriet and left her behind a bush. Brought Harriet over to the lounger where she's made her um, identification of Emily and then pretended to die. And that's why he didn't uh, immediately ask for the, the ambulance to be called. He went to yeah. the, the railings and moved them. And he sent the man who had to walk very slowly. Yeah. Um, once this commotion's cleared down, they've switched back. Mm -hmm. And that body has been taken away. One thing we didn't mention the funeral, Mrs. Gantry, I think, said nobody around here would recognise Harriet. Mm. That is garbage. Of course it is. The body would be identified as who it was meant to be because that woman would have been reported missing. Yeah. Especially if she was pressing, she was pregnant. Yeah, so she's obviously got someone in her life to, yeah. who's impregnated her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's nonsense. And also the fact um, when he put her down, there was no wounds in her back, despite having been impaled from her back right through her front. Yeah. Tell us how the blood ended up in a neighbour's well, sink. I don't even know if it's blood, but Harriet put either blood or fake blood on herself mm -hmm. to make it look like she'd been impaled and then was washing off. The discussion then turns to the pipe, the tree, and what happens next. That wooden pipe, turned out, wasn't that much of a clue in the scheme of things. If you hadn't made such a big deal about hiding it. Curse of a crime writer. Exploiting all those parallels just seemed to knit it all together and that mess in the hall i take it was your handiwork the day i went back for those reading glasses <sighs> you never flowered it was easy and that was always the beauty of it splendid pink blossom in early spring <laughs> so what now if this were a detective novel. You'd hang yourself from one of the branches, cloaked with shame. I'd turn myself in and your friend would go free. The real world, sadly, is not so neatly structured. They didn't believe your story last time. You think they'll believe this one? All right. Her condition, we had no idea about. Would it have made a difference? I don't know. I do know it was a lunatic idea coming out here in the first place tonight. Can I suggest, sweetheart, whatever we need to discuss at this stage of the game, we discuss another time, another place? Of course, but of course when I got your text, it seemed so early. My text? Hang on, it was you. Before we find out who sent the text, to clarify, what they were doing with the syringes was feeding the tree? I think it's like that thing in Jurassic Park where they inject the... DNA of one dinosaur <laughs> into another one and they create this sort of combined dinosaur monster thing. I don't have any green fingers. You can't do that, can you? Or do you do that? Do you I don't know. inject it with stuff and it makes it blossom? I've never injected a tree with anything. It's just nature. Look for things that naturally occur. <laughs> yeah, just let it take its course. Yeah. Okay. Over at Green Lanterns and speaking to Mrs Gantry, we discover how she found out about the crime. Yeah, she was polishing the pews when Hugo did his confession and she stopped to listen in. But I don't understand how she got them to believe they'd received a text from each other. Yeah, you'd have to spoof each other, or certainly one of them. I don't believe she even knew how to do that in 2010. I don't believe she knew how to send a text. No. She's one of those old people's phones that you didn't have text, it was just a, a big yeah. phone with large numbers. Yeah, said it was a landline. Yeah. <laughs> we also find out what happened to Emily. We see her in her cell just looking sad. Yeah, she has been convicted and she's going to rot. Well, Mrs Gantry says she thinks things have worked out for the best. Mm, yeah, that's debatable. Uh, but Father Albrecht's dead. Yeah, he is. Uh, <laughs> there's a letter from the church informing them of his passing. Is that what the church does? They write to people? 
It might right if she was also the housekeeper. I don't know for him or a close. Mm, yeah, maybe. Maybe. He did, however, have the foresight to make a DVD. Yeah, to conduct his own funeral service. <laughs> yeah. I thought this is very BBC humour, isn't it? Yeah, I liked it myself. I did enjoy it. Yeah, so, yeah, so he's presiding over his own funeral and in his own coffin that he built himself. Hugo is at the funeral. Worth y- noting. Yeah, he's looking very sinister. Harriet is not at the funeral. She's not, of She's course. She's dead, obviously. Yeah. So what we have to assume here is that Jonathan and Joey have turned a blind eye and are allowing this pair of murderers to get away with it. Yeah, I think we should deal with this now because that doesn't, that's the end of the main plot. So, yeah, this is no one's idea of justice, surely. No, it's despicable. For a start, that woman got a fair trial she for was, the crime that they're accusing her of. They were both found not guilty. Yeah. So just accept that justice has done its job. Jonathan and Joey have only heard Hugo and Harry's side of events. Yep. They could be lying, they could be psychopaths. They are psychopaths. They are liars. Yeah, and they could be wrong about the brother. He Maybe he did attack the girls. Yes. Maybe he saw them at the side of the road, pulled over and attacked them. Quite possibly. We don't know that. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing to prove either side of the case. Jonathan and Joey need to go to the police and let uh, the... Let the system... Well, first of all, apologise for allowing Ken Starkus to be killed. And then, <laughs> once you get back on the police's good books... Yeah. Yeah. No, this is ridiculous. It's... I mean, it's not... I'll say this, I think it's badly written for Jonathan. I don't think this is in his character. No. I think you would compare it maybe to that, the Columbo episode where he lets the woman off with killing her husband. Yeah, but she was... That, she had a terminal illness. Yeah. but we compassionate. Remember, if you remember when we discussed that, mm-hmm. though... We concluded that notwithstanding her illness, it was a horrific decision. Oh, yeah. To commit the murder, and Colombo lets her off with it because she's forgotten it, and that wasn't really justice. No. And similarly, this isn't really justice. No, it's, it's terrible. It's shocking, actually. Yeah. Yeah, no, this woman should not be in prison. She shouldn't, no. Not only the fact that even in um, Hugo's version. version of it, she wasn't involved directly in the murder. No, she at most would have been a, what, an accessory. Yeah, and she had no idea the woman was going to. Her friend was going to kill the guy. No. Even in the most outrageous version of the story. But she's now been convicted of murder and will serve yeah, the, the, the term associated with that. Yeah, it's not fair. And she also might go mad because she's been tortured. Yeah. This is one of the, again, one of the big flaws in this. Hugo would have no way of knowing... Okay, so the suggestion is that she has put some sort of mental block on this whole episode in her past. Yeah. And can't remember anything. But Hugo would not have known that. Okay. But he's went to her shoe shop where she worked and offered her employment. He he could not know that she would not immediately go. But he saw your shoe go because he must have been at the um, the trial. The trial. He's a famous writer, so it would become well known that Shugo's that this well known mystery writer had a brother uh, who was murdered. Yeah, I thought it would make more sense if it had been the guy that was killed by the falling facade. Yeah, except that didn't happen. No, it was all in her imagination or her mind or her lies. Yeah. Who even knows what happened? I don't know, but I know that Jonathan should not be turning a blind eye here. No. Nor should Joey. Or Gantry. None of them. No. I've said this before with Jonathan, he well, should be jailed for this. Yes. It's again, it's a, yeah, he's covering up a crime. Yeah. A serious, serious Very crime. Very serious the most crime. serious crime. And he, he has no way. Again, it is slightly different if you are saying, okay, Jonathan knows exactly what happened and they're an, a wronged party. So we'll let natural justice. But he, he can't know this for yeah. sure. There's no possible way. No bit of a scumbag isn't he yeah let's finish it on a lighter note yeah talking of scumbags adam is <laughs> introduced at a comedy gig by <sighs> an uncle tom are you saying that i'm not saying that no i'm, just... I'm saying it's a a black comedian whose lines have been written by a white man yeah who criticizes the intellectual white middle class for telling him what to be offended by yeah and introduces adam on stage with joey and we cut to jonathan watching a copy of this performance yeah, Joey and Adam return in high spirits, you might say. Yeah, now, again, this wasn't too clear either. So, it turns out that this video has also been manipulated. This is the cleverest one. Describe it. So, he's dressed as a grand wizard in blue, performing these tricks, and someone's edited it to make him look like he's in clan robes with a burning crucifix. <laughs> yeah. Now, the way I read this was that Jonathan was the person behind these... I think it's implied, but not confirmed, that he might be the person. I don't think it's stated that... You can't no. take it that he is. But we Which never it, see Adam again, so... We don't, yeah. And it's just that during this episode, Jonathan 
for each of these videos, uh, he'd been explaining how clever it was and how, that, what exactly they'd done. Exactly how to do it, yeah. So that, mm, not sure. It's certainly possible. I think people are right to make their own minds up. Again, it? a little bit scummy. If he's your boss if it and, is friend, him, yeah, and potentially horrible. friend. And, I mean, what I thought might, what I thought was going to happen is that, as we've seen before with Adam, any sort of publicity to up his profile. So I thought this would be... He'd be mean, in on it, maybe, and yeah. yeah, and it's you know, a viral campaign. But no. No, no. I wonder if the, the lesson from this series is that fundamentally Jonathan Creek is not a good man. He's not brilliant, is he? He's not He's not a great man, that's for sure. And we're not talking little issues, we're talking big, major, you know, people trafficking. Moral feelings. Mor yeah. Moral feel yeah. I think that, that might be one of the big sort of take-homes we get from this entire podcast, that Jonathan was actually quite an unsavoury person. Well, we'll look back on that in about four episodes' time. We will. I mean, we have to remember as well his, his disgust that he has at... Uh, a bald women or women with odd tongue and their physical attributes as well. He's, yeah, yeah. he certainly gets some very major personal failings. We might need to do a, a pros and cons list for the, the final episode of the show. Yeah. Okay. We'll leave that till then. No doubt people will have their thoughts. Yeah. Is that us then? Wrapped up? Well, yeah. But you've missed the little bit with Joey coming in and the 315 joke, but it wasn't that good. So no, we'll just leave it. Okay. It's been quite long so far. Let's for the hardy few if you're still here send us a tweet at Creek Podcast to let us know that you heard this much of the show because you're deserving of recognition we'll rattle through the, the trivia here we've got some production information the 4th of April 2010 at 94 minutes in length David Rennick again was writer and director Natalie Walter played Emily she was born in 1979 so as we mentioned she would only be what in her nine no, yeah, 31 when it was f filmed yeah so yeah early, early 30 yeah you may have seen her in Horrible Histories, Doctor Who from 2008, Doctors, or Babes in the Wood. You obviously recognised Hugo as Paul McGann. Born in 1959, he's one of the, the four McGann acting brothers. He's the good one. Yeah. Possibly most famous for Whitney and I, but also Hobie City, Doctor Who, The Time War. Doctor Who from 2013. He's the Doctor. Yeah, Doctor Who, Shada, which is... Uh, uh, no, audio, not, yeah, yeah. So I think he's the eighth doctor. Okay, he? yeah, the eighth official doctor. Yeah. Luther, tripping over fish, uh, or our mutual friend. He was originally cast as Sharp, but broke his leg playing football, I think, in Ukraine, and the role went to Sean Bean. And the insurance payout for this was the largest in British TV history at two point one million. Fair enough. I think Bean's made more than that from Sharp, though. I think so. Quite unfortunate for. McGann, because it was uh, I don't know, 13 movies or what Yeah, I've you? never watched it, but I know it's popular. Very popular, yeah. I, th I made a star of Sean Bean, I think. Yeah, I think he would have been a star eventually. Mm. Sasha Bear played Harriet. She was born in 1971 and has appeared in Casualty, Da Vinci's Demons, Hobie City, Sherlock, Doctor Who from 2008, Coronation Street, Doctor and the Bill. That's almost a full set there. Nearly bingo. Mm-hmm. You may have recognised Doreen Mantle, who played Mrs Gantry. Yeah, she looked familiar. I couldn't be certain. Born in 1926, she played Mrs Warboys in One Foot in the Grave, the neighbour. Probably from that, but I think this is something more recent. Okay, she has been in Doctors, Coronation Street, Hobie, Jam and Jerusalem, Doc Martin, The Bill, Casualty and Sam Saturday. Dirt Gently, I think she was in that. She was, I think, yeah. Netflix show. It was. I didn't like it, but I think some folk did. Mm -hmm. It certainly had a cult following. I recognised Ian McNeese, who played the father Alberic, born in 1950. He is famous for Doc Martin. Doctor Who in 2010 and 11. Rome, June, From Hell, Pie in the Sky, Minder, Stay Lucky Lot. Again, massive CV here. And finally, we should mention Stuart Milligan, who played Adam. This is his final episode. He has been in 15 in total, starting with a dance macabre. He was born in Boston in the States in 1953 and has also starred in The Assets, Doctor Who in 2011, Doctor Who Dreamland in 2009, Spy Game with Robert Redford, Spies Like Us with Chevy Chase, The Legend of Snow White and A Quiet Conspiracy. He wasn't obviously, as we've discussed before, the original Adam, but he certainly made the role his own, I think. I think he did a very good job as Adam. I liked what he did with a not always likeable character. Yes, I think that's right. He played a... An un sometimes unpleasant character very yeah. well but he, he added a charm so you didn't hate him that's it he tried to keep it on the um, agreeable side just about yeah yeah 
Do you have any trivia for us? No, there wasn't much. There's no extras in the DVD for this one. Right, and okay. there's not much written about it. So The only thing I have is that Sheridan Smith and Paul McGann starred together in the audio versions of Doctor Who, where she was his companion for four seasons. That would probably be very good to listen to, I'd imagine. Okay, episode review. Okay. Motive. A revenge. Yes. Clues. <laughs> Again, I run through them. There's quite a few here. I probably missed a lot. The vision in the woodshed, the switching picture, the blowgun instrument, Isis, uh, Hugo carrying Harriet, the fact she was pregnant, echoes of old movies. Uh, what else was there? The fact they hired yeah. Emily. Mm-hmm, in the first place. I suppose a movie facade. It's all connected. I think the blood in the sink's a clue. They didn't really talk about it, but who would have blood on them? Yeah. When you think about it, there was no blood until the person landed. Yeah. The gotcha. Okay, so that was the text message which led to Harriet being revealed. Yeah, from Gantry hearing the confession. Yeah. And apparently guilt or innocence isn't appropriate here, or it's already been decided. Yeah, so the scales of justice have spoken. Yeah. If scales could speak. Mm. See, so, I mean, it's an interesting moral or ethical dilemma that you might have. If you know someone is guilty of one crime but hasn't been committed, would you be happy for them to be found guilty of a crime that they were innocent of? Yeah. But that's not exactly what happened here because Jonathan, as we said, can't be sure. Exactly. Mm. Okay, next time we have the clue of the Savant's Thumb. Yes, that's the final one of the specials before we get on to season five. Yeah, and back to a more reasonable runtime. What is it? I think it's another 90 minutes. Oh, great. Oh, you mean after that? It's yeah. back to more reasonable. Okay. Yeah, yeah that makes more sense. <laughs> Okay, so until then, cheerio. Bye-bye.